Happy New Year, and welcome to Mile High Stash, the podcast that asks what five albums you would take to a remote Colorado cabin in the event of a zombie apocalypse. Armed with only food, water, and a crank-powered Victrola. We have a little twist on our theme today, because Adam Turla from Murder by Death is my guest. Uh, Murder by Death pioneered live concerts at the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park. You know, the, the hotel that inspired The Shining by Stephen King. Um, if you've seen rock shows at the Stanley, it's because Murder by Death started their annual Stanley run uh, 10 years ago at, in Estes Park. And, well, it worked. Um, I've played a bunch of shows at the Stanley, too, and um, it's really because the sort of Americana, gothic, haunted rock of Murder by Death works so well there. And the Stanley decided to make live shows a year-round thing, uh, which is great. Um, anyway, instead of the whole zombie cabin thing, I asked Adam to list the five albums he would take to the Stanley if he got stranded there, Shining style, and, you know, was in the caretaker role. His first answer is really funny. Um, Murder by Death r returns to the, the Stanley Hotel this weekend, uh, on the 6th and 7th, and then three shows next weekend. Uh, my talk with Adam Turla of Murder by Death is next. But first, Mushroom. Colorado Mushrooms is a Brighton-based farm-to-chef operation that was founded in 2019 by two friends who have quickly found a home for their exquisitely tasty mushrooms at beloved Colorado restaurants all along the Front Range. More than half of the mushrooms in the United States come from Pennsylvania and can be weeks old before they reach your plate, but Colorado Mushrooms are often served same-day fresh. Ask your favorite restaurants if they serve Colorado Mushrooms, which include Blue Oyster, Lion's Mane, Black King, Pio Pinos, and more. Get in touch at coloradomushroomsllc.com or find Colorado Mushrooms on Facebook and Instagram. Hello. Hey, how's it going, Adam? Good, how are you? Oh, not bad, Adam. man. <laughs> it's been a while, I think. Yeah, been a minute. Yeah. But thanks for, sorry it was a little late. Oh, you're fine. It's nothing, five minutes. Um, How are you? I'm good. Just, um, I'm in the, like, holiday merch mania right now, which yeah. is, it's just, it's such an active time for people supporting the band and buying stuff that, like, I, you gotta do it. <laughs> and, like, yeah. and I'm sitting here uh, packing up vinyl and, uh, also trying to like, I, I was literally just trimming out a door <laughs> yeah. because I, I we put a new door on the back of our house and like, yeah. and it's like all these end of the year projects. Yeah. I should probably start by saying that I am currently drinking out of a murder by death mug that you only get uh, if, you, if you see, if you see them at the Stanley hotel at least five times. So, uh, <laughs> I, I should admit my, fandom you know before people start listening to this but um um first of all how did you make it through the pandemic you know not just the band but the restaurant too yeah it was crazy i mean honestly it's it's hard to almost tap into that feeling but i, I was hanging out with some friends last night and they were talking about you know, that night like the night that the world shut down mm -hmm. um and yeah, we we played a show. It was March twelfth in Minneapolis. We were on our twentieth anniversary tour, and we just had this like streak of sold out shows that we were going through. About three weeks left, and then right before we went on stage, we got the call that the rest of the tour was canceled, and that basically like every venue had said it's over. Yeah. And because at the time there had been a lot of talk about, you know, if it's under a thousand capacity, it'll be okay. Or in this state, it's this and. And so far it seemed like we were okay. And we just did not, 
nobody understood what was going on and how crazy it was. But um, so we, the next morning, we basically all either jumped on a plane or beeline home. Um, and, you know, we were, we all assumed that we were sick because we'd been on the road for a month and we were just waiting for the symptoms to appear. And then the restaurant, you know, then we're like, well, it, at the time we really just thought it was like concerts you know we thought mm -hmm. that uh, we were thinking it was these big gatherings we just did not understand the scope of the fear around how transmissible it was and um and then but it soon became apparent that the restaurant was gonna have to close too so uh they closed the restaurant for three months and Jeez. basically uh you know the bills were just piling up um we decided to do a kickstarter because we had just bought like a ton of merch like to get us through the rest of the tour right and we were just like we the, they literally were delivered on march 12th uh and it was just this massive amount of restocks because the tour had been going really well and we just weren't at the point in the tour where we had been profitable yet so we owed you know the crew money and you know that we owed the band money and you know ourselves and so it's just a really scary time but uh you know we we ended up doing kickstarter we started a patreon we kind of just pivoted to online stuff and fans were just fucking <laughs> saviors you know they yeah. saved us and it got us you know they got us uh able to pay our um bills and you know have money to live on and i basically just ran mail order through the whole pandemic and eventually we reopened the restaurant or we have a restaurant called pizza lupo which yeah. is a pizza place and um um we you know that was a huge decision we we basically once we realized that we had to close and we understood the scope of how bad everything was we said we're not making people work this is insane you know the idea of making people go in to work during this mm -hmm. no and like the government this is why governments exist is to figure out a plan in these extreme circumstances and you know it's like it was a moment where you have to say i guess i believe in the system at least a little to right. step in right. here and not completely destroy our civilization <laughs> and um so, you know, we basically told employees, like, we've done a lot of research, just like go on unemployment, like you got to like, we're shutting down, we have no idea. You know, we didn't know if we could afford to pay utilities for the restaurant, that kind of stuff. And then eventually, um, you know, some grants and that kind of stuff started appearing for the restaurant. Of course, nothing for the band because uh, art is not valued in America, but um <laughs> you know that we were able to pivot luckily because we have this fan base that is so considerate um that you have was, the most incredible fans in the in world that's what i think i mean honestly for being a band as small as we are um being able to operate on the level that we do with i mean you've been a really great supporter and there are journalists who do support us but as a whole, we're pretty much ignored by most of the music industry. And it's been like, it's been like that for most of our career, um, where it just kind of seems like, well, we're just going to keep making art because at least there's enough listeners to uh, sustain it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, the pandemic for us was totally traumatic, um, really scary. I really thought at one point that we were going to lose, you know, like our house, our restaurant, you know, the band it was future, you know, momentum is really important in music. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've been just, uh, we went out and we've done two tours since then. Um, and uh, we're working on stuff for next year. We got the Stanley shows coming up. So yeah. we're kind of, we're, the band shows up tomorrow morning. We're recording some cover songs. Okay. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we're about to get back being busy with them. Yeah. I want to ask you about the new album, but first, um, I would like your first choice for an album in the situation where you were stranded at the Stanley Hotel. It's snowing. It's only you. Un unfortunately, uh, Sarah's not there with you. <laughs> uh, maybe the dog can be there. I haven't thought about that. But, <laughs> um, 
uh, everybody has seen The Shining. And just imagine if Adam from Murder by Death is stranded, uh, Shining style, and is uh, the caretaker of the Stanley, and there happens to be a, a, a record player there. Uh, what is your first of five albums that you would bring with you? I'm going to be honest that what would really happen, I'm going to start with something that messes up your question, but <laughs> it's what would really happen is that I would sing, I would make up stupid songs <laughs> that I would just have running in my head right. the whole time. And I would be singing songs like about pee pee poo poo or something. <laughs> like I would literally, I would, that's, my Jack Nicholas or not Jack Nicholson and uh the shining would be just me going insane singing songs about the dog and pee pee poo poo. It, it's <laughs> like the it's, pizza it's, party song too. It would be something like that. It's yeah, like I have these little songs I sing to myself that Sarah just will eye roll me or uh <laughs> But living with me is I'm constantly making up so, like very, yeah. very silly songs. Um, so that my first song would be the the true song or uh, or the call it an album of insane nonsense hits. I like that choice, especially if you could somehow, you know, after this experience of being stranded is over, then you you actually make that album of the silly song. Give me a project to do <laughs> while I'm stranded right. in this horrible hotel. <laughs> yeah. um, you seem like a deadline person. I uh, I uh, have a lot going on, and uh, I'm a I'm a consummate list maker. I love I have a daily list that's just like usually like a junk mail envelope that I'm just write out what do I got to do today, and yeah. I it's my way of um, dealing with how much I have going on um, because I do have to I have to not push myself otherwise i i will overextend myself because yeah. and that and that's something that i've really sort of struggled with is that you, you have to decide like why you're doing things sometimes it's like mm -hmm. what the, you know there's there's parts of this job that um i love writing like music and i love recording but one thing i've learned that i just don't really care about is like, I don't need to go be on, I don't know, whatever, like tiny desk or something. Like, I don't care about the like accolade of it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I honestly don't want to have to fit it in when I'm already playing a show in New York city. Right. Um, like having to play a second show that day is like, this is, this is a nightmare. <laughs> like, it's not like the, I, the, I've really started to learn like what things are extra and, mm -hmm. um, I mean, would it be fun if like everybody had all their gear and we were just hanging out in New York City and then we fit that in? Sure, but we don't have the money to just go do that. Like it would have to be like, you'd have to be working and it would be another thing. And I've, yeah. I've really been trying to like learn how to uh, acknowledge the stuff that uh, that is just extra that doesn't personally matter to yeah. me. My first question about the new album, which I don't know if I should refer to it as Spellbound or if the, if there's a either way, either way, or if we, yeah, we just wanted to like, we put that little uh, mark the, the dash there because I really like the idea of thinking about both of the words, yeah, and and I think that the word Spellbound, you know, it's been used a million times for albums and songs and everything, but um, we were thinking about like. Oh, I never really thought about what it, what that all the all the meaning in that word, mm. and we were imagining about the uh, the the actual idea of like a spell binding somebody or the feeling of being mesmerized or you know just all these different qualities of it, and that was sort of a, a function of a lot of the lyrics of the album. Well, my first question was, you know, seeing that you are somebody who is so busy between the restaurant <laughs> and the band, um, I wonder if if anybody ever has to ask you to get up out of your bed and stop sitting on your hands. I would think that <laughs> probably not. Um, it's a funny, it's a funny thought. I think it, that song, that, that's from our first song, um, uh, Get Up. Yeah. And 
I started writing that song in maybe 2016, 2017. And I had all these versions of it. I wrote it so many times, uh, which, you know, it's happened sometimes, but it's not that common for me to continue to uh, totally rewrite a song. Mm -hmm. And I just, I could not get it exactly where I wanted it. And um, the, I think that song was sort of the first time that I was examining the, the feeling of being overwhelmed and like getting in touch with myself of being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was doing the restaurant. I mean, like we, we bought this, 1860 building and then I spent 11 months just like all day every day there designing working on dealing with all the various contractors um then also trying to plan a restaurant uh I was trying to you know we had borrowed like seven loans to get the money to make this happen and and I'm managing all the money and bill pay and the loans and the bankers and everything and um it was so much bigger and harder than we thought it would be and then the restaurant opened and it was overwhelming in a completely different way. And so anyway, I was trying to write a song that was about the feeling of, uh, oh, oh, the other thing that happened was during that time was we bought the building in September of 2016, thinking that like, you know, America had been kind of like on the mend from 2008 crisis. And we really had, we were feeling pretty optimistic about things that had just been bouncing back. And it, you could see the economy strengthening. And we're thinking like, oh, we're opening this business. Um, and then fucking Trump got elected. Yep. Like as we're doing the build out and we were like, we're, we were trying to open like a modern Italian restaurant in Kentucky. We're like, cool, this might be bad. And, <laughs> and it was bad for a while. Mm. And, you know, it was hard. I mean, it was, you know, people who just like weren't that familiar with like Italian versus Italian American food. Um, you know, I mean, at one point there was Nazi propaganda that somebody left in the bathroom oh, there, Lord. you know, stuff like that, where, I mean, we, there was all kinds of crazy stuff that emerged from uh, the influence of that presidency that was really, you know, we were like, you know, we did not feel good about the economic implications. And so it was really scary and overwhelming. And then when the pandemic hit, I started working on this song again. And all, like, it was the realization of that um, fear and overwhelmed feeling manifested into song. Um, so it was that feeling of helplessness and exhaustion and, uh, uh, I made a, I made a slight reference that I don't know if anyone will appreciate it, but like in that song, there's, there's a line that's like, and I, I don't want to fight no more, uh, but they don't know what's right no more. And the wolves are howling at the door. And, um, there's, it's actually a reference to a book by MFK Fisher, called uh, How to Cook a Wolf. Yeah. And it's also a reference to our restaurant, Lupo, mm -hmm. which means wolf. Um, and How to Cook a Wolf was a cookbook from, I think, the 20s that was uh, centered around um, austerity. And it was all recipes that were like, when the wolf's at the door, what do you do? You cook the fucking wolf, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it just kind of everything crystallized together and made a a song that I, I am really proud of and it, something that I was not capable of completing until I had not just like undergone those feelings, but like processed them. Yeah. Fill your pockets up with hope So much that they choke I think that's a, a, a large part of why people support you and, and identify with you, you know, your fans, because they know that you made it through, you know, playing in basically any venue that would have you, you played in a boxing mm -hmm. ring. Right. And yeah. you have these lines in your songs, like a life in the red couldn't even make rent and stuff like yeah. that. And, and so they support you and they get support back. I mean, they're not just giving money huge. to the Kickstarter 
for um <laughs> it's not completely altruistic i mean what you give back is amazing and then you know um you had that story of like taking your fans to a cedar point right and like <laughs> <laughs> spend basically spending the money that that they gave you on hanging out with them yeah, I mean that's like you know it's like we we have to keep back some for, for, for yeah. our for our expenses, but like yeah, I think for me it's a value exchange. It's I, I approach I approach every single thing that we do with, um, I want people to feel like you know we live in a capitalist society. I don't love capitalism as a strict model, but I think that it's workable when you um, approach it with an ethical slant, and so. You know, I mean, even down to the pricing at the restaurant, we charge a lot less than honestly we should for some of the food because um, the quality of the local ingredients we're using or the imported ingredients versus what you would be getting. Like, you know, if you look at like Papa John's pizza, we actually look at stuff like that as price models and they're using like the lowest quality stuff they can possibly use that's mass produced. It's gross. You know, yeah. And like, and we actually try to match with people's perce perceived value of our stuff, whether it's the food at the restaurant or the um, the objects that we're selling. And mm -hmm. my goal is to for nobody to ever feel overcharged, if possible. Mm -hmm. I always want people to feel like it's worth it, and that we are th that you know that we're considering what they're, what we're asking them to spend if we are trying to sell something. And, and I want them to know that like we are, like I am thinking down to the dollar and, you mm -hmm. know, I'm talking, I have a manager who helps me with a lot of these projects. He's, you know, a really helpful person and part of our team. And um, he regularly has to convince me like to, to, to basically make more. it a little bit more, mm -hmm. just a little bit more. And he's like, I'm, and he understands he has the same values as me. But like, he's like, you really aren't leaving enough for this condition, this, this, or like if something's damaged in the mail or like if, you know, if they underprint it and you're, you know, you're calculating it on, mm -hmm. you're pressing a thousand of these, but sometimes there's an underrun and there's 950. And then, you know, like yeah. he's, he, he thinks about it. He basically defends me from myself <laughs> because the truth is, is that we are so broke for so long in this band that, um, you know, it's not that we, I guess we got used to it sort of. And I just don't, it, I don't, you know, I want to be successful and I want, you know, I want the things that everybody wants, I guess, but like, um, I don't, I don't need to like have a, you know, I don't need to be like rich from this. Like the, the satisfaction of being a musician comes from the, creation of the actual art like that is the healing thing that actually happens in my life like when we go on tour i'm pleased by the attendance when it's good you know and i'm mm -hmm. i'm grateful for um the cheering and the support uh but sarah and i joke about this sometimes like we're not theater kids like we don't like being up on stage is equally stressful as it is, uh, you know, engaging. And like, mm -hmm. I would rather, like, I just want to make art in my life. And sometimes that's, you know, it's like, I've got these comics that we've been like, uh, this Christmas I'm doing a promo where I was just like, yeah, I forgot people actually like autographs and they might like that for Christmas. So we're just like autographing the last of the hardcover ones and selling them. And it's like, this project was cool because I can't do, I can't draw for shit. I can't do physical art. And we got to hire 20 artists that can. And so for me, getting to work on ideas with them and to pick the artists and curate it, um, that was a side of, um, it, basically what the project is, is there's, for people who don't know, it's, we, uh, it's 20 artists and I had them each pick a murder by death song and they illustrated the lyrics in like comic book style panels. And, um, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so, um, the idea is that it's like a lyric book, but it's presented as if it was a comic of like tales from the crypt or something. Yeah. Fuck and, yeah. um, 
Yeah. And it's fun. And, um, it, but I got to work with all these great artists and like watch their process. And it, you know, it makes me feel, uh, because it's my idea and because it's my like, you know, project, uh, that I've, uh, curated, it gives me a sense of satisfaction that like I made something. And also the main reason I thought of doing it was that it was a way to give money to the artists that we work with during the pandemic when they were all like, people were messaging me like, yo, you got any work? I like, I I'm a tour poster designer by trade and right. nobody's on tour. And so I'd just be like, yeah, actually here, do this for me. And that's how I got the idea was I was literally just trying to give people work. And, um, you even send people was, bird houses. Oh yeah. That was, that was well, incredible. Yeah. So I did, I did a post where I was, I said I was going to do 25, but I did a hundred. <laughs> um, I was, I said like, if you're a first responder, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, whatever, like whether you're a checkout clerk or a, you know, ER doctor, just shoot me an email and I'll send the first 25 people. I'll make you a birdhouse just during the, because it was like every it was at that time in the pandemic where everybody's just like trapped in their Stuck. house and, mm -hmm. and it was spring and I was like man people should just look out their window and look at some birds and um that would be nice and I needed something because I was so stressed I, I was waiting to find out if the government was going to like do something for the restaurant mm -hmm. for all our employees you know and they did with you know like we were able to um, hire people back and, you know, we operated a loss, you know, but the the grants helped with that um, because we didn't want to put people, basically we didn't want to put people back to work until they had been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So when we reopened in July of 2020, we went for 10 months doing just um, curbside and delivery. And so, because we just weren't, we weren't going to make people, um, they just, you know, we asked them what they wanted and they were like, eh, I don't want to get sick. And, yeah. you know, but um, anyway, uh, but like during that period, I was really stressed that there wasn't going to be a solution that, you know, we needed a Hail Mary. And um, uh, so I just made those birdhouses as a way to be like, well, thank you for all you people who have to go out there and work yeah. because, <laughs> um, but I think it was nice. Like it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was, it was a good project for me as well as just like something cute to do. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. I mean, I don't, I don't think the guys from Metallica were sending their fans birdhouses. I mean, <laughs> they should have <laughs> a Lars Ulrich original. Yeah. <laughs> I actually tried to get, um, uh, what's his name? Nick Offerman to match me. Like I oh. somehow got his like, uh, assistance, like email. I can't remember how through some channel. And I was like, I really want him to like make some too and match me, but like mm -hmm. he was like holed up somewhere and like his wood shop was like somewhere else. And right. but he was like, I like the idea. But <laughs> I thought I was just trying to be like, I want I was like, what if what if a bunch of people started doing something cute like this, you know? Yeah. Okay. So um, you're holed up at the Stanley Hotel and give me please your maybe second and, and third albums that you would bring with you. Okay, so Disintegration by The Cure is just one of those, like, mm. my most listened to albums of all time. It's like I a movie. Out. Yeah, it is. And that's probably, like, all these al albums are going to be the ones that, like, made me mm -hmm. the musician that I am. And, like, that was my first band that I was just like, whoa, this is this is something else. And uh, my stepmom was a big Cure fan, and she had a bunch of their records on vinyl, and she took me to see them in maybe like seventh grade the first time. And uh, uh, that was that's that record. You know, it's like I love their catalog. I mean, anything that came out from their start to like late 90s was just deep in my psyche. That was my mm -hmm. period that I just dug in. Um, and uh, that album just has such a comprehensive album feel. And it's also very wintry. So I think it's like the perfect, like that's like my number one winter album. So it's perfect for the, for the Stanley. What's number three? Let's say around that same time, this, it's funny. Cause when I, when I, I started getting into music in about sixth grade and I got 
deep in in about seventh grade and i started just being like oh this is like a part of me and um i would say my number two i was in a car my friend's big sister was you know driving us around somewhere and she had this cassette that was like a bunch of like ska punk on one side and the other side was uh the Pogues album, If I Should Fall from Grace with God. Yeah. And it was so raucous and beautiful. And I was like, whoa, you can be both. And the lyrics were uh, the best I had ever heard at that point. You know, it's it was like, like James like, Joyce and punk at the same time. Yeah. And yeah. It, exactly. And that, that became a hugely important band for me um, in understanding what I think is interesting about music. Located in Heavenly Gold Hill, Colorado, the Gold Hill Inn was built in 1924 and has been owned and operated by the Finn family for the last 60 years. The inn is known for its fabulous three or six course meals and unforgettable concerts by local artists from Gasoline Lollipops to Gregory Allen Isakoff. To get up to where time stands still, take Sunshine Canyon or Four Mile Canyon from Boulder and experience the Gold Hill Inn's wonderful food and music with all the fictions. I don't respond to a lot of music. I'm not, I think, like, I see people making these lists, like, my 30 favorite songs of the year or albums of the year. I'm just like, if I love one album a year, that's rare. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't, for me, like, in the music world, it's not, I just don't respond the way that I did when I was younger. Mm -hmm maybe because I'm too close to it. Um, just it being such a part of my work, but that period of my life stuff leapt out at me in just enormous ways. And, uh, that record and Shane McGowan's swagger and, um, lyrical prowess was just like yeah. staggering to me. Uh, <laughs> so I figured, to open I for figured them. Out, we did, we opened three shows for them in 2006, which was literally like the only other person that opening for the cure like if I did that, I mean, honestly, that's, that's it for me, you know, like, I mean, I love other bands like, I, you know, it's like, but I don't need to open for Iron Maiden or something. Like <laughs> I've seen them. It was great. But like, you know, it's like, there's people that I think are, are great, but like, as far as coming full circle and seeing your life kind of complete an arc, opening for the Pogues was an enormous experience for me. Man. You were talking about the music you liked as a kid and, and remembering when you first heard it. And I, I've never really asked you about what you were like as a kid. And I've always wanted to... Ghost Fields is a song that, that makes me think, oh, what was Adam like when he was you know, in these neighborhoods as a kid? Were you into um, zombies and ghosts and, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, well... So it's funny because Ghost Fields is actually not even about me. That was more, that's more about a bunch of my friends from college who grew up mm -hmm. on farms and uh, that they, I was sort of writing more about, I was, that album's a very like Indiana album. I was writing mm -hmm. about where we were living. I was really like feeling the sense of having lived there for about 10 years, maybe 13 actually by then. But, uh, uh, but I, I, it was an experience that I'd heard a lot of my friends talking about is like getting out of their farming town, you know? Yeah. And, um, and that, you know, and also just the, like the American implications of that, you know, with factory farms and everything. But, um, f when I was a kid, I, I was a weird little nerd. Like, uh, <laughs> like I, I was, um, you asked about like ghosts and stuff. I was just thinking about this recently. I, I started reading really young. I was a huge reader as a kid like i loved reading books i was always reading and as soon as i could go to the library um and pick out my own books when i was maybe like four or five i started reading every book on like bigfoot the loch ness monster mm -hmm. and aliens i was like this is my thing and ghosts mm -hmm. and i was just into it that was like in immediate interest for me um and so you know as a kid i was like obsessed with like 
Ghostbusters and like, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, never ending story, the last unicorn, um, all this magic and fantasy. And so I got really into stuff like the Hobbit and I played D and D as a middle schooler, um, video games. And then like, I kind of, when I was 14, I had been really into music through middle school. And then like, I turned 14 right before I started high school, like in, yeah, like the month before I went to high school and I had, my buddy got a guitar and I, my friend's mom was like a garage sale nut. And she was just like super, she went like to every garage sale in the neighborhood and she bought this acoustic guitar for $20 and I was working at a pharmacy and I was like, I had a little money and she's like, Hey, I thought you might want this. And I was like, I'll buy it from you for 20 bucks. And so I started playing guitar. Oh, I also played baseball. I was like a serious baseball player. Um, and so like I, when I went into high school, suddenly my life switched to music and baseball for, um, and then Buddhism, I got really into Buddhism hmm. and, and Taoism. And that's why I ended up studying in college. But, um, but that was like, my high school was like this intersection of Buddhism and Taoism with baseball and wow. music. And, uh, and then I stopped playing video games and, uh, I was just kind of like figuring out more like i don't know like adult things that i was into and then i stopped playing baseball when i went to college uh largely because i was more into drinking drugs and music <laughs> so, uh which that was somewhat short-lived but uh that's what i was into at that time <laughs> what was it like to play the stanley the first time having been someone who was into that kind of thing it was wild you know it was an idea i had about a couple of years before we did it and we finally made it happen. Um, and I think as like, I'm a huge movie fan. I always have been. And I think just like having the tie in to that pop culture was really fun for me, honestly. And obviously it is for so many people because so many people come to the event um, mm -hmm. and travel to, to go there. And I did not understand what I was doing. You know, I did not, um, know that it would be such a phenomenon and that 10 years later we'd be talking about i mean i i don't even know i have to go back and count but like how many shows have we even done there now it's so many it's like 30 40 something and mm -hmm. um it used to be three and now you're doing five is that right yeah we've done five it's hard to keep track <laughs> yeah so i think we've done five four times because we did like the big outdoor ones in 20 oh yeah 20 i guess or 20 21 i don't even remember what the pandemic anymore but like but yeah we have not missed a year oh yeah it would have been 2021 we did the outdoor ones which was like it would in have been summer. doing like doing like six or seven as far as capacity mm -hmm. but um uh and then we only did three last year because we we did the summer one like a couple months before right so but now we're back to five but uh but anyway i had no idea that it would be so, such a phenomenon but also it's like the thing that made that I, you know you're asking me about like the you know we we're talking about value with the fan stuff mm -hmm. i just try to think like what do i think is cool um right and i just try to be like okay well i have a vehicle to make cool things so I'm going to make them and hope that other people think they're cool too. And that's like, that's what you're doing when you're starting a band is you're saying, this is what I'm into. I'm making the art that I believe in. Um, you know, and I think that's what's so strange when you get into like review culture, review culture of like art sort of ends up just being somebody else saying, yeah, it's not what I'm into. And it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause it's like, imagine the thought that it takes to like create just an album. It's so much work, you know, yeah. you have, you have put months or even years into making thousands of micro decisions to do something the way that you think is best. And sometimes, you know what, sometimes like, an album doesn't feel that great or it feels lazy or whatever. And that's, that's true. And sometimes you need somebody to point that out, but like it still took a ton of decisions and it took somebody saying, this is what I think is cool. 
And, um, you know, that's, that's all it really is, is it's somebody trying to execute something that they believe in. And, um, unless it's, I guess, like, you know, just like a grab at like pop stardom or something. Right. This is assuming we're talking about something that like falls under the banner of art, you know, it's genuine. Yeah. Just like, but it's, it's so interesting to me when, when, um, when I see like commentary on something that I think, whether it's my own or somebody else's art where it's like commentary, like that basically doesn't get it and then criticizes it because it's, it's such a strange, it's just such a strange concept. The idea that like, there's no response from the artist, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like the critic acts as if there's a conversation happening right but it's right. but like but it's like the art you know sh- it should stand on its own but you also don't get to explain your own art in the art because that's tedious right. <laughs> so like, that's what i was so talking about with the podcast too that's what i was i was talking about is having you actually speaking for yourself instead of some asshole journalist <laughs> basically saying well, um, I interviewed this person and this is my interpretation of what they meant. And here's some of I, what they said. Well, I think it's great. I mean, I think like, obviously, like I, I love journalism because it gives you presenting a question sometimes gives, gives a person who's asked the question an opportunity to think about something they have never really thought about, or it mm-hmm. gives them an opportunity to express themselves. So it's very valuable. And it's like, I've had great interviews with people that I really enjoyed talking to and then the product that came out afterwards surprised me or was yep. disappointing. And everybody's done that who's ever been on that side of the mic. Mm-hmm. Or it's like, or somebody paraphrases something and it takes a different meaning or appears to have a different meaning. It's just part of the difficulty of the trade. But like, you know, that's why I don't, I don't have any negative um, actual feelings towards the concept. It's just <laughs> that it's, it's just that it's a, uh, it's a really challenging thing to do. I mean, it's like it's like when you see an article that leaves out a really important detail in the headline that makes it like seem like something else happened. You know, yeah, it just happens all the time. And editing is is a very very hard job. Um, it's not it's not that hard to not misquote somebody though. I gotta say, yeah. it's not that hard. No, you're not wrong. I just, I just think like, it's just, it's a lot. And, you know, it's like, obviously like with our weird, with, I mean, you know, it's like newspapers don't pay what they used to and yeah. clickbait is the way for, to generate money. You know, mm-hmm. it creates a different kind of content, but uh, it just, it's a challenging time. So I try not to be like too aggressive, but I don't know. It's, it's, I always, I'm always surprised. Like I, whenever there's an album I really love, I'll, there's like a couple places I'll check to be like, surely they hated it. Like, you know, yeah. because, or if, or if there's an album, like this is the worst thing I've heard in years, you know, and I'll, and I'll check to see who loved it mm-hmm. because it's just like, it gives you this like perspective on um, just like the, uh, you know, the other in your, in your world. Like, you know, it's like, it, there's just so many, there's so many ways to look at, at, art that you have to like sometimes you have to like check in with with the stuff that that is going to shock or surprise you yeah well i think one of the things that's actually good about social media and all and also spotify which after what happened with neil young and joe Rog- joe rogan actually dropped off a of spotify but mm-hmm. um i don't think many albums are getting popular um, or unpopular quickly just because some critic didn't like it. I think it's it's more crowdsourced now. It's it's getting popular, you know, because people are listening to it, and that's it. And so there's not it doesn't seem to be that like one bad review in Rolling Stone or even Maximum Rock and Roll or something is is completely turning people off, you know, where a critic is. There was a, there a, was a time where like if like one of the flagship publications like did an early bad review that mm-hmm. everybody was kind of jump on the bandwagon. You were and, done. The album was done. Yeah. I've seen that happen, but not for a while, at least yeah. that I, not that I've been paying attention to, but yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that the technology is constantly changing the way that everything works. And, you know, I mean, like, obviously, like the AI art thing was the big thing this week. <laughs> you know, it was like, first of all, you see all these people posting their portraits. And then like two days later, you start seeing artists be like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like, and and then you start seeing like the crazy contract stuff and, you know, where it's like, Oh, cool. The robot is using your image to teach itself. Like, great. Awesome. Nobody understands how this technology really works. Awesome. <laughs> it's, it's like we're constantly having to revisit even the innocuous things like this app, you know? I'm surprised people didn't learn from those photos that made you old. Remember, remember that? Yeah. And what happened? I don't do any of that shit. Oh, my God. Well, what happened with that? Um, <laughs> was that it turned out that some Russian dis disinformation campaign was getting everybody's info from them <laughs> signing up for those aging photos. Yep. And now that we're in the AI thing, I'm like, didn't you, didn't you learn from what happened before? Why don't you just opt out of this? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like nope. everything is a deep fake now, basically, mm -hmm. where it's like anything that you are putting out there is just more content for whatever crazy iteration of the singularity is yeah. next and it's yeah. like which is you know i like i'm not a i'm not a conspiracy theorist warrior but it's like you know i've talked about this with sarah where it's like all this stuff is it's like if you've ever read about singularity stuff it's it's interesting and it's you know it's this idea of um self-aware uh ai yeah. and so for me it's just kind of like it's the idea of of not needing human um, uh, interaction to control whatever the process is. But like, mm -hmm. but for me, what I think is so fascinating is like, well, we're already doing that. You know, it's like, we're yeah. already in it. It's like, there's so many things that are just operating on their own. And like, we believe that we have control, but it's like, everything's already kind of plugged in and we're, you know, whatever whatever people are worried is going to happen is already <laughs> on its way you know yeah. and and that, so that's one reason why I, I sort of choose to just i don't stress about it but yeah. also it's like i'm not going to just get whatever app everybody starts posting about all of a sudden because there's very few things that in my life i have ever valued that got really big really fast yeah you know like <laughs> you should be wary like, of those things yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like, that's, it's never worked that way before. So like nothing I liked ever blew up. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, when you're stranded at the Stanley hotel, there would be no technology, oh. no social media. And what is your number four album you'd bring with you? Okay. So I think I'm on, I'm on this like seventh grade trip here. The other thing that I got in seventh grade, also for my stepmom's uh, record collection, was uh, David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Nice. Um, it was definitely the first time that I had uh, thought about, like, gender bending. And um, even though, like, th that was the other thing, is The Cure... Uh, I don't think I'd really seen like photos of them. So I didn't even know, like, I remember later being like, Oh, like sometimes like Robert Smith dresses like a girl, you know, like I just, mm. I had no, or he wears makeup. Like I had no idea of that until later. And then later I was like, Oh, okay. And like, in my mind, my dad was an art dealer. And so like, I was around like interesting ideas and we were like, we go see like art movies and just i saw a lot of like stuff that was um breaking down like social con like social constructs pretty early in my life and so i just felt like i was like that's just what they're into and but with david bowie it was such a defiant act i think he really wore that um character in a way and and, and through the lyrics which were really wild too um in a way that made me think about it in a new way. I was like, wow, this guy's really out there. And the album is is both technically really interesting, but also just like a freaking rock album. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics were so 
crazy to me. Like, just there's so much slang and um, just, like sass in there <laughs> that I w- I remember like laughing with my friends. We'd be l- listening and be like, you know, like I'm an alligator. I'm a mama papa coming for you. It's like, wh- uh, I was like, what is what is he talking about? And he was the Naz made... with God given ass. That's another one. Yes, with God given mm-hmm. ass. <laughs> it's such a good line. But uh, yeah, but he he was so out there that it um, opened up my mind to a like form of expression and, you know, just sort of like there was a freedom to it that Mm -hmm. excited me and that, uh, you know, like I was playing sports and stuff. Like I was playing like, you know, baseball and some basketball at that time. Um, And like, there was nothing freeing about sports that I could find. You know, there was no, like you couldn't be yourself. I mean, even at, you know, even at that time, like realizing that I was like a weird kid and that like pretty much everybody else on the team that was weird got like weeded out by the, you know, the, the job, job culture. Type. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, like, I remember watching like talented kids just kind of get like pushed out of the system Cause they were a little weird mm-hmm. and like, I was like hanging on in that world for a while because honestly, probably just because I was a lefty pitcher and we were rare and they probably had a big opinion about weirdo lefty pitchers. <laughs> and like, but anyway, the, uh, I saw like a freedom in that, that excited me. And so I don't know, like I would listen to that record. It doesn't have a lot to do with the setting, mm-hmm. but, um, I think it would, uh, the sense of freedom might be valuable when you're trapped in, in a uh, place that you don't feel like you have that freedom. <laughs> Your new album um, has a lot of slow songs on it. And it's amazing how they're slow, but they're still powerful. And that's that, that's something that I think is hard for a, a lot of bands to even think to do. And um my question for you is how do you think that you and and Sarah and your other bandmates when you were younger and you were making you know this music that uh, something like Rum Brave um, or Brother uh, is mm-hmm. punky um if you heard Spellbound at that age what do you think you would have thought about it I'll tell you right now that I think that this record taps into actually a period of writing that we were doing before either of the songs you mentioned, because like brother is 2006 and right to the close 2008. And I mean, we started the band in 2000 and most of our stuff was really slow early on and very dark. And Mm -hmm. it's uh, more like orchestral kind of stuff. Um, When you go back and listen to our first two albums, most of it's pretty plodding. Like I remember a review that my friend wrote like later we would become friends but like um he wrote in like 2001 that described our music like uh like the magma flowing down a volcano <laughs> like it's like slow but deadly right. and I, I remember thinking that's really clever like and that is what it is and you know it's like some, he was able to describe something that we were trying to make in a way that we had not processed yet. And um, that's what so writers I, is like that song. Writers is, is yeah. definitely like magma flowing. Yeah. And that song, that's my favorite song on the album. And I uh, is interesting because uh, it's honestly like probably a top three song for me and I love it. And uh, it came, it just came out. It's the last song I wrote for the album. And I presented it to the band and I was like, guys, we don't have a ton of time to work on this. Uh, but it's really weird and I'm just gonna have to teach you. I know how we're gonna have to arrange it because it's gonna take forever to do it otherwise. And basically what I did was I made everybody in the band learn how to play. I think there was like three different main parts, like just like a three different distinct melodies. Mm -hmm. And so everybody needs to learn all of them and just call it like one, two, three. And then I'm gonna like conduct you and I'm going to be like, okay, you and you two play a part one. And then I'm, and when I point to you, 
Sarah and Emma, you come in with part number two. And so what's happening in that song is that we're actually like trading melodies across instruments and inserting mm. them strategically for the arrangement. Wow. And um, and they overlay in different ways. And there's all it's 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 really more of like a composition with this airy kind of vocal uh singer songwriter thing happening um over it and um anyway i was really happy with how it came together and it, um and it seems to be a fan favorite so that made me really happy But yeah, I mean, the slow stuff was what we started, what we got into. And then I think what happened was that because we were doing so much like punk, kind of like we're playing like basement show punk houses. Mm -hmm. And that was the world that basically got interested in us. The slow songs, we we didn't have good enough gear or like PA systems that we were playing through to really catch the nuance of this mm -hmm. band early on. And I think that we pushed more into the like, rock and roll kind of punk songs like the ones you mentioned mm -hmm. because they could be heard over the crappy sound systems we we're playing on and I, I there's a part of me that wonders a lot of those songs are responsible for our popularity um but there's a part of me that wonders like what our trajectory would have been if we had had a like uh less diy um experience in this industry like there's there's a, there's this trend of music in the last like 10 years that's honestly just based on the fact that the clubs are so much nicer than they used to be right that could not have existed in this like basement show diy space culture that we came up in um simply because you would never have heard what they were doing and it was just not effective live music and now there's like this like much chiller stuff that like uh, has been able to get popular and um, because it can translate. Um, but so I don't know, like I always wonder sometimes like what if we had stuck to that? But the truth is I think it was more exciting to explore different sides of the potential for the band and have yeah. more variety and as a career, you know, Yeah. but we're still here. So yeah. <laughs> It worked out. You can't change the past anyway. So, yep. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know that Murder by Death really started uh, music at the Stanley, and I'm I'm surprised by that. You know, because really, I just assumed everybody knew. <laughs> no, they take it for granted now. You know, because they've seen leftover salmon there, or they've seen a Devotchka yeah. there, and and they they just they say, oh, there's music at the Stanley. And um, I, I'm constantly telling people, no, that it, 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 it happened because of murder by death. And yeah, nobody had ever done it. Yeah. Of how much um, a part of, of the um, Colorado music scene do you feel like not just the Stanley shows, but in, but in general, is this like a, like a second home for you? I think it really has become, I, I think whether or not it's like, you know, so our Tyler, our bass player, lives in Denver. Yeah. And yeah. we started seeing, you know, Denver blossom into the music scene. I never would have guessed it got as big as it is now. I mean, it's like the number one selling music market in America now. Really? And yeah. And uh as far as like like concert tickets sold, I mean, Red Rocks, the capacity yeah. and the popularity really help with that. And the fact they're like doing shows like every day. Now there's Mission Ballroom, which is also 4,000 people, yeah. and they have shows every yeah. night, basically. Yeah, and so it's just there's just a huge demand for live music there, and it's an easy place to travel to, and that's, I think, part of the success of this family. But, um, you know, I feel, like, really connected there because we go every year and spend two weeks in Colorado and around the Denver area in Estes, um, and you know, like I have the restaurants I go to like every time I have little spots I pop into or parks I like to walk in or, you know, mm -hmm. like there's, you start feeling like you are a resident. Um, 
as a, you know, I don't know that I feel like it's funny when you say scene, it's so funny because it's like, we have friends bands, like we're friends with the Nathaniel Ratliff guys. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, sometimes they'll come out to our shows and we go to their shows and they, they come to the restaurant and um, we're buddies with those guys. Um, partially because we met them through uh, their tour manager is a guy who was our tour manager for like eight years. And he's one of our best friends. And so we we were always trying to catch up with him. And then eventually we became friends with the band. But it's like, but we've also never played together. And, um, you know, it's not, it's more just like a community of people that I've become friends with right. through our time there. I think at this point, we're just such an established act that we kind of just show up and we do our thing. And, uh, you know, like we, we try to do like fundraisers occasionally that are in that area or, you know, and they had those wildfires and Estes, we raised a bunch of money for that. Yeah. And like, you know, that kind of stuff are like, we try to like stay in touch with it, even though we're not residents, but we're there, you know, I, at one point I was actually like trying to find a house that we could like, live in for like two months of the year in Denver and like do writing and rehearsals mm -hmm. out of, and then maybe rent it the rest of the time. But basically it was, it's just too pricey now yeah. uh, for us. But like, I, I was seriously considering like spending part of the year uh, just like setting up like that being the band's home. Uh, but I think we got priced out, unfortunately, <laughs> but, um, but you know, we just don't have the money to have like a house that just sits there. Like if it could be a rental or something and we could be there part of the year. Cool. But, um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess my point is we've really considered, uh, like making it more of a home even, mm -hmm. but just going back and doing a yearly thing is something that I think the band really needed. We didn't have traditions before the Stanley. And yeah, I have said, before to friends and family and in other interviews that like the year we started every the year everything changed for us was like 2012 where we did our first kickstarter in 2012 and we put our first stanley hotel show on sale in 2013 and like all of a sudden we had been doing diy things the whole time like booking our own shows or like putting out our own vinyl or you know doing self-releases but all of a sudden, um, doing the Kickstarters and then combined it with the tradition of the Stanley, we actually had like a thing that was going to happen every year or every other year for the Kickstarters. And it became this really uh, an anchor that we had never had before. Yeah. Because I think you're, when you're in a band, especially when you're as young as we were, I mean, we were 18 when we started. And you are just like, what, what is the expression? Uh, like serene on the surface, but paddling like hell underneath. Mm -hmm. It's like, like a duck, you know, or a swan. Uh, you, you, people, it appears like you're doing this fun, cool thing that you're playing shows, but it's like, you're really juggling a lot of different work. And, you know, it's like, you're doing travel logistics, manufacturing, you're rehearsing, you're playing live, you're not sleeping, you're, you know, you're like all these things that are, and you're just hoping, I guess, that you reach some manageable level of success that like pays for itself and then makes it worth the work. But it kind of never really happens for most people in any tangible, healthy way. And so we, you end up like having to stop or telling you know, or having to quit because your real life gets in the way or, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, but that created like a stability for us that was, that actually felt like healthy. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's like being able to say, okay, well, I'm going to manage this Kickstarter and do it within the means that I think are feasible. And then doing, like, knowing that every January we're going to have our Stanley shows it created um, both like a economic stability that we had never had before. And also just like a predictability to our year, you know? Yeah. Which we, the, which we never had that before. Does the Stanley still have a mystique for you, you know, with the hauntedness and, and all that, or after 10 years, is it well, that depends just, on the day for me, but yeah, yeah, I still, every, every time I go, every year I go, 
I have like a feeling of like otherness that happens, whether it's just like that I'm struck by the grandeur of Rocky Mountain National Park mm -hmm. or the feeling of the property or the, you know, or if something spooky happens, which does happen sometimes. And then, or just the feeling of gratitude for the event and the stability mm -hmm. of it. And, you know, there's, I have a big feeling experience every time I go up there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, actually with no, um, yeah, just, in total honesty, I it has not left me yet. I thought it would. I thought I would feel a little more like jaded or mm -hmm. I, I just you do something for long enough and like if you're honest and you're not just like pandering, like you know, this is a fucking job. Like this is a job for me and has been for a long time. I also but if you're gonna talk about it honestly, you have to acknowledge both the stuff that feels like work and the stuff that like gives you real satisfaction and then the stuff that gives you gratitude and um you know that's that's never gone away like that event it's i mean we we have talked about i think what the trajectory of the band is that eventually uh we will stop touring altogether except for the stanley wow. and that's the idea and that the idea is that uh to borrow uh what the pogues did they would do a christmas show every year um in dublin and uh they did that even after the band was like broken up for a long yeah. time and they would just do a traditional show my, my friend jackson flew out to see it once um because he's my buddy who's a similarly huge fan but um you know it's just one of those i think having an anchor like that in your life can be really positive yeah it's hard to imagine for me like like going on tour in my seventies or something like, you know, like Fleetwood Mac or something. You know? like, yeah. I, I I'm really impressed by them, but like, as you get older, you know, it's like the idea of just being like having a known quantity and be like, Oh, that'll be nice. That'll, it'll be fun to see the band. It'll be nice to see the mm -hmm. bands that I know from over the years. And, you yeah. know, you like that you start to say like, Oh, actually that's what's really important to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not just like, my job that I'm stressed about or tired from it's something, you know, bigger. And just something that 100% you want to do. Yeah. yeah. And you're doing it then presumably because you, that's the thing you want to do. You're not just like going out cause you have to, Yeah, you know, that's yeah. the thing. There was a point where I resented it a little in, you know, like maybe the early 2010s where we were just having to tour so much, because we just weren't making that much yeah. and just like to be able to make ends meet, we had to, you know, do so many shows compared to what um, would have been sustainable. And so then you start to resent having to do that and having to work so hard for that hundred bucks or whatever. And, you know, it's like, cool. I drove eight hours today, slept for four hours. I got a hundred bucks. Like, okay. Like, you, but know, you never just, complain. And it was unless like, there are less than a hundred people there, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, that's the rule. <laughs> that time in Boise when they were ninety nine paid, <laughs> we let them have it. <laughs> the greatest concert I've ever seen was the Pogues in Dublin in two thousand and seven. I was there for oh, one nice. of the Christ one of the Christmas shows, and it was my first time in Europe. Um, and they did Fairy Tale of New York, and oh, a yeah. Sh a Sinead O'Connor came out. Oh. She was dressed as Santa Claus or Mrs. Claus, and oh my I, God, I, I love just, her! I just had tears streaming down my face the the entire song. It oh, was great. That's so that's so nice. Like I would have loved to have seen that. Um, that's yeah, that's the song that really first struck me by that group because it's it's like the lyrics that are so crass combined with like extreme beauty of yeah. the music is like just such a incredible work of art yeah. um but yeah i mean uh that sounds amazing i've never seen the the uh, dublin shows um but uh i think about them a lot because uh the, they've lost some members since 2006 yeah um yeah. people that were really really kind to me when we opened those shows they were very warm to us mm -hmm. uh 
and uh, they seemed really grateful for the success of those reunion shows. So uh, yeah. it was just like, it was a really cool experience. Last question. What is your fifth and final album that you would take with you? Last one uh, is uh, Homogenic by Bjork. Uh, oh. Another record that like just a little later than the other ones, I'm doing these chronologically, um, that just blew my mind. Uh, it is, uh, you know, when I was starting to realize what was possible with music, I think my friend had told me about Bjork and I was like, I thought she was like a electronic musician or something. And what I did not understand until I got this record until she played it for me, um, was how it was both, uh, super organic and electronic and that there was a level of composition and artistry that was just so, so much farther in the direction of, um, you know, challenging art than I ever knew was possible in that genre or whatever I thought she was, you know, whatever I had assumed was her genre. And I just, that record just like blew my mind about what was possible. Um, and I got really into, uh, one of the things I loved about that record was her, uh, she's very spare with her lyrics. She doesn't write, treatises and mm -hmm. she you don't realize how few lyrics there are until you're looking at a, sh a sheet of them right. and you say oh wow there's only a couple lines but they're really powerful and they're used to great effect um so, and it helped me i think as a songwriter to understand that sometimes you don't need to be so verbose and that's something i have trouble with anyway is just like articulating my intentions so i can prowl on sometimes but um it helped me as a writer to just condense 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 and songs like um hunter another incredible winter song uh that just feels like you are in like an arctic tundra mm -hmm. like pulsing with a snowstorm and uh she is a huge influence on me uh and there's a couple songs that I've just like literally been like, I'm going to try to write a Bjork song and um, try to make it fit into the murder by death world. Oh. And uh, uh, there's uh, like two or three of them that are just like straight up homage uh, or point of inspiration. Um, and in fact, actually, um, so we did, we're working on this covers thing. So we did these as you wish albums right. where uh, fans could like pick a song and we'd cover it and, um we decided that uh we're doing one that will come out next year called as we wish yeah. so each person song that you want each person in the band got to pick one song um and i picked a bjork song and um uh, and we already recorded it and i'm so happy with how it came out um and so fans showing up tomorrow and we have to record three more um we're doing the covers that were also uh when we did the Kickstarter this year for our latest album, uh, on the last day we surpassed TLC. They had a Kickstarter and I guess <laughs> we raised more than that. And so the joke was, if we pass TLC, we will cover a TLC song. <laughs> so we're recording that this week, That's which awesome. I'm like excited and intimidated about, but uh, it, it'll be a, so we're doing, we each pick the six of us each pick a song and then we're doing a TLC song. <laughs> It'll be a funny release. It, you know, it's just kind of like a, it's like a little uh, sidecar uh, release where it's it's more for fun than anything else. They're great though. I mean, I think my favorite one is the Megadeth cover. That was probably my favorite one. That, you know what? I'm really happy with how that came out because I love the idea of covering Megadeth because Dagan, our drummer, when he gets like really drunk at a show, which it's been a while since he's been this drunk, but like, we'll be driving to the hotel sometimes afterwards, and every once in a while he'll just be like, "I have to hear the album Rust in Peace right now," and he will <laughs> like, he will like just make everybody blast that album, and so uh, it's it's this like hilarious the fact that somebody else picked the song, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't know what to do with it, 
And then when we realized that we could give it like an almost like surf samba feel, right, it right. made it so funny mm -hmm. to us at least. And um, to just like make it like sleek and smooth. And I, I just think it's such a, it's such a laugh. And that's the fun part of doing a cover is like, sometimes there's a song that just like is poignant when you cover it. Sometimes you just got to make it funny. Like it's, just go for something totally different. I'd like to see a show where you only do the covers from the uh, As You Wish albums. That would be really awesome. I've thought about it, but the thing is, you know, we literally, like, we would go in having, like, I have not rehearsed any of these songs. And we go in and we would do, like, two, three songs a day. And, you know, you'd, we'd get some music out and we run it for, like, 30 minutes. Right. And then re press record. And then it's, like... Kind of forget about it. I don't know how to play most of those songs at all. Right. And like, sure, I could relearn them, but it would just, it would be a big undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've considered doing it. Um, I just like, I think it would just have to be the right place, right time, you know? Yeah. But uh, it, it would be fun. I just think also there would be audience members who are like, are you play brother? And it's like, oh, right. okay, well, you know, <laughs> Well, thank you so much for talking with me and especially for talking with me for so long. We usually talk for 20 minutes or so. Yeah, no so, worries. So it was great. Call and me on a good day. <laughs> nice. I'm excited to hear your album of silly songs. You know, that's that's <laughs> that's the one that excites me the most out of the five. Poo -poo, man. <laughs> I'll give you another hour. Gotta run. I got Thanks for listening to Adam and Adam uh, on this episode of Mile High Stash, which was uh, more like Stanley Hotel Stash. Um, I've definitely experienced ghosts there, but now I'll just be thinking of potty songs when I walk in. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say so long on this episode until I say uh, a major thank you to both Colorado Mushrooms and the legendary magical Gold Hill Inn for their generous support. Um, check out Murder by Death at the Stanley Hotel this weekend as well as next weekend and look out for their new As We Wish covers album soon. Um, if you enjoy this podcast or even think it's not the worst one you've ever heard, please follow us. Um, you can follow Mile High Stash on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to stuff. Even better, write us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does go a long way. See you next week. So you want to rise above duality? You want to transcend day and night? Yes, I'm old-fashioned. I just don't show your passion for ever change. Twilight. Go on and give oblivion a shot.